It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson is here. Lots to talk about. Yeah, that 3 million toothbrush DDoS attack thing. Maybe that wasn't exactly how it happened. Steve has the details on that. Uh, why is password security really just security theater? Yikes. And then we're going to talk about what probably many of you heard about, the, the BitLocker hack. Is it something you should worry about and what can you do about it? Steve's got a very simple fix. You'll want to listen to this episode for sure. Security Now is next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson. Episode 961, recorded Tuesday, February 13th, 2024. BitLocker, chipped or cracked? Security Now is brought to you by Delete Me. Have you ever searched for your name online? Oh, don't. It's a nightmare. You will not like to see how much of your personal information is there in public. That's why you need Delete Me. Not just for your own personal use. It does reduce the risk of identity fraud or credit card fraud, robocalls harassment, unwanted communications, but it's also good for cybersecurity. In fact, if if you ask me, every executive, every manager in your business should have a Delete Me account. We found out the hard way before we started using Delete Me when uh, Lisa's direct reports all got text messages saying, quick, I'm in a meeting and I need 20 Amazon gift cards sent right now. Of course, we our staff is well trained and <laughs> they did not fall for it. But you got to wonder, how did they know who her direct reports were? How did they know what her phone number was? How did they know that what their phone number was? It's all online. That's why we signed up immediately for Delete Me. Now, let me explain how Delete Me works. You're going to give them some basic personal information, just enough for them to find the record about you so they can remove it. Delete Me's human experts will go out and find and remove your personal information from hundreds of data brokers helping reduce your online footprint and keeping you and your family and your business safe. But this is really important. Delete Me will then continue to scan and remove personal information regularly. That's because these data brokers are nasty individuals. They will repopulate your record. After they delete it, they'll go, okay, yeah, we'll delete it. And then they'll go back and fill it right up again because all that stuff's still out there. You need somebody out there looking out for you constantly checking we're talking everything addresses photos emails relatives former spouses phone numbers social media accounts property value income value and since privacy exposures and incidents affect everybody differently their privacy advisors at delete me will ensure that you get the support you need sometimes it's just like an arm around you saying it's going to be okay. Sometimes, though, it's really there are things you need to worry about, things you don't need to worry about. It's great to have an expert on your side. Protect yourself. Reclaim your privacy by visiting joindeleteme.com slash twit and using the code twit, T-W-I-T. That's joindeleteme.com slash twit. Offer code twit for 20% off. It's time for security now. Yes, you wait all week long for this moment. I know you do. Steve Gibson is here, the man in charge with the latest security news. Hello, Steve. Hello, Leo. Great to be with you. This is the 13th, which is regarded as a, you know, sort of an unlucky number, at least in the West. I I know China's got a whole bunch of numbers. Oh, They're yeah. They, eight into, is lucky. I can't remember what the unlucky ones were, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, 13, though, this course, is the day before Valentine's Day, so it's only unlucky if you haven't bought Lori a gift yet. Oh, the best thing about my having chose... Actually, she chose me more than I chose her. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is no that she necessary. could care less. Oh, Absolutely. Oh, I have to like, you know... By the way, honey, it's your birthday. What? Oh, uh, love that. So, <laughs> love that. it's wonderful. Love that. Yes, Val. I, I've been in earlier years of my life. It's this has been the Valentine's Day was my most hated, it's terrifying day. Oh, and because you know, girlfriends were comparing. Yeah, you what can't, the other what yeah. their friends, boyfriends, or husbands uh, 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 did, and it's like, well, he did more than you did. It's like, oh <laughs> God, just shoot me now. You can't win. <laughs> you can't win. You can't win. So what is anyway, What's in the What's in the docket for today's show? Uh, uh, we're, we have a mostly 
listener driven show because as I was going through the 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 incoming from our listeners there they expanded into some really interesting discussions so we do of course have what's the story behind the massive incredible three million toothbrush takeover attack oh i'm so sorry i brought that up last week no no you you were you were right where the rest of the internet suckered, was at I that got point suckered with everyone we were else. on the leading edge of a fiasco although if um, i had just used my mind my noggin i would have realized how hard to believe it was but anyway you'll get to that well, okay, so so we have, there's some interesting stuff that went on with oh, that. Good. Okay. Also, we're going to look at how many honeypots are out there on the internet. It's uh, more than you might think. Also, what's the best technology to use to access our home networks while we're traveling? Exactly why, get this, is password security all just an illusion? Oh, no. Oh, yes. Does detecting and reporting previously used passwords create a security weakness? Will Apple's opening of iOS in the EU drive a browser monoculture? Can anything be done to secure our routers? <laughs> really problematic UPnP, you know, universal oh, yeah. plug and play. I just turned that off. You told me to turn it off, so I turned it off. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Has anyone encountered the unintended consequences we theorized last week? The answer, uh-huh, and I even even I have are running personal email servers no longer practical. And mm. finally, what's up with the recently reported vulnerability that afflicts affects many TPM, you know, uh, trusted platform module protected BitLocker systems. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's so, a big one. Yeah. Uh, today's topic to was ti or today's podcast titled BitLocker Chipped or Cracked. So Oy. I think we have another great podcast for our listeners. Well, uh, this would be a good time maybe to mention <laughs> Security Now is brought to you by Bitwarden, if you are using a password manager, may I make a strong recommendation for the only open source password manager you can use at home, at work, on every device you've got, absolutely free. I'm talking about Bitwarden. It's what I use, it's what I recommend, it's what I tell everybody to use. Uh, and by the way, I love it because Bitwarden knows that you are a technical audience, so they always have the most technical ad copy here, just for the Security Now audience. Uh Account switching, account switching, one of the new features on Bitwarden. They, you know, they did the secrets thing, which is fantastic to keep you from accidentally putting your API secret into your GitHub, you know, accidentally committing it to your GitHub repository. They're always adding features. That's one of the nice things about Bitwarden. Account switching is now part of the Bitwarden browser extension, which means you can log into up to five separate Bitwarden accounts and switch seamlessly between them in the desktop without leaving the browser. This is great for personal and work Bitwarden. That's for, that's by the way the way it kind of works. You set up a personal account, you add your organizational account, uh, you have access to both those vaults, and now it's easy to switch. If you're self-hosting, Bitwarden has developed a Helm chart to enable deployments to Kubernetes clusters, which is nice because if you're already using Kubernetes, you can you know keep that software stack simple without needing to add a new service you just you just you've got bitwarden and the helm chart generating and managing complex passwords with bitwarden is easy as can be i just love it in fact i just started using the arc browser and it works so beautifully with arc I, it's almost like they they knew uh it is the trusted credential management system as far as i'm concerned named by wired as best for most people Honored as Fast Company's 2023 Brands That Matter in Security, Bitwarden is the open source password manager trusted by millions. And at least us two as well. Two, one million and two. Uh, get started with Bitwarden's free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan. And I always love this. And this, you know, I know you're using a password manager, right? But you know you have family and friends and coworkers who ask. Tell them it's free. Sometimes they say, oh, I don't want to pay for it. It's free for personal use across all your devices. It supports a it supports a, a, a Yubi key. It supports uh, pass keys, all for free forever. Go to bitwarden.com slash twit. Find out about the enterprise plans, the Teams plans, or the personal plans. Bitwarden.com slash 
twit. I like to do this with Steve. I have not seen <laughs> the the picture of the week yet. I am ready to scroll <laughs> it up now, though, if you are ready. Yes, this one I I gave this one the uh, the title: Your Municipal Tax Dollars Hard at Work. Uh oh, now John, I can't show this at this point because you haven't switched, uh, given me a. Uh, uh, a, a switch for the uh, computer screen. So I guess people, you're just going to have to look at your uh, <laughs> show notes. Here, here it is. Your municipal tax dollars hard at work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish you could see this. Maybe Steve, you're just going to have to describe it for us. Okay. So, well, I always do for our, for yeah. our, for our listeners who are driving and commuting and jogging or whatever it is they're doing. They're listening rather than, than viewing. This is just another one of those insane, like, what are they thinking? So so we have a street corner where it was zoomed in on just one corner, like where you would have sidewalks of, and it, look, it looks like a rural community. We see a, a something in the background with a couple trailer homes and a, some parked cars and some, you know, screens and things. It looks like rural U.S., and okay, now we have it on the screen for those who are watching the video. Um, <laughs> and and uh, there's like a patch of si con sidewalk concrete, which and 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 the 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 curb is dropped down to street level, so that if you're rolling up on, on you know in on, on a, with, with with a wheelchair, um, you'll you'll not have to go over the bump or you're using roller skates or whatever. There's even that, that, that special textured, uh, in this case, it's bright pink and kind of nubbly rubber on the leading edge. So that, so that I guess if you're not sighted, um, or maybe in, in, in a wheelchair, you know, you're able to sense that you're on the edge of the sidewalk. The problem is this sidewalk extends maybe a yard you know may, maybe three feet <laughs> and then there's this big sign sticking up that says end of sidewalk because well i mean it's huh. correct at least you got up the curb okay but i just you know leo you look at this and i mean the the the, the pictures we've been showing recently you know they, they there just has to be a story behind them oh, I, i'll like, tell you the story this is malicious compliance yeah. this is complying with ada regulations but the problem is and it's this is the same way in petaluma i don't know if it's what it's like where you are but developers don't want to put in sidewalks so if they're not re absolutely required by city regulations to put in sidewalks they won't and uh, this is an example of the they had a, a ADA compliance feature, which is a curb cut, but they didn't right. have to put and in a sidewalk, so they didn't. So it's not a sidewalk; it's a side step. Yeah. Because basically, yeah, you take no one step and then you're it's done. Ridiculous. Just it, it, ridiculous. and it's and and I was thinking maybe the, the 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 corner is there to join another sidewalk running in the other direction, but it looks like but but there's grass along there, and it looks like this is aimed at only you know in only one direction of 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 entry from the from the uh, street. Anyway, it's the you know, least they it, could do, literally. And in case you weren't sure, Leo, <laughs> yes, the sidewalk has ended. So you know because there's grass. So there's a end of sidewalk sign posted. <laughs> I like that. That's a really useful piece of uh, information. Yeah, because yeah. you wouldn't know otherwise. <laughs> you would if you were wow. in a chair. You would immediately uh, yeah, yeah. sense the change in terrain. Good lord! Wow. Eish. Wow. Okay, so. Um, just as we were recording, and I, I did give this one the, the title, Brushing Up on the Facts, <clears throat> just as we were recording last Tuesday's podcast, news was breaking across the internet that somewhere around 3 million electric toothbrushes had all been compromised and had been enslaved into a massive global botnet and more that actually it had been used to attack a, a Swiss firm, blasting them off the internet completely. And I so, owe you such an apology for breaking into the show, breathlessly relaying this story. <laughs> I should have known better. 
Uh, yeah. Why? Why isn't that in your notes, Steve? Well, oh, geez. I should have known uh, better. So. The Independent's, but Leo, really, you were in good company. The Independent's headline was millions of hacked toothbrushes used in Swiss cyber attack, report says. Fudzilla, well, that's a, that's well named. Uh, their headline was hackers turn toothbrushes into cyber weapons. Oh, boy. Boing, boing, uh, headlined millions of smart toothbrushes used in botnet attack on company, even ZDNet. And they ac- actually made it even worse w- w- the way they ended their headline. ZDNet's headline, three million smart toothbrushes were just used in a DDoS attack, period. Really? Well, not really. Um, Tom, even Tom's hardware. Three million malware-infected smart toothbrushes used in Swiss DDoS attacks. Botnet causes millions of euros uh, in damages. We even know, Leo, what it costs. We don't. The, the company was that, that was attacked. <laughs> oh, God. And so finally, The Sun. The Sun reports over three million toothbrushes hacked and turned into secret army for criminals. Criminals, experts claim. Now, in my defense, this news headline came over the wire ex- as you were doing the show. And, yes. But I should have used some critical thinking because I have one of those toothbrushes. They're not connected to the Internet. Right. They have Bluetooth. They do not have Wi-Fi. They, they do connect. to. I mean, I guess you could, in theory, hack them because they do connect to your phone. So if you had a so malicious it could have app, from the phone into yeah. the toothbrush. Yeah, and then you had a malicious app that then. And this really brings a whole new meaning to the notion of disinfecting your toothbrush. Doesn't <laughs> yes, it? yes. But th- there's not enough power in there. There's not enough memory, and most importantly, there's no Wi-Fi. Well, there were many, many similar reports, hundreds. Yet none of them, of course, were true. Highly respected news outlets repeated the story because, well, talk about clickbait. Oh, goodness. So how exactly this massive reporting screw up came to pass even today remains a little unclear. I should note that all of the responsible Reporting, for example, Tom's hardware. I think it's had three updates uh, since then, and like really been diligent in rolling this thing back and correcting their own record. So, so everybody who who did this, what you know, said whoops and like and fixed it. But, uh, um, uh, I think that well, part of the problem is in following up and following back this trail. The parties who were directly involved still to this day disagree about who said what to whom. This occurred during an interview um, with a, well, I've, I've got the details here, so I'll, 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 I'll explain it without quoting myself um, or misquoting myself. But, you know, what was originally published was certainly, you know, hair curling, if not teeth straightening. So here's what the world read. The wor- th- This was in the original article. She's at home in the bathroom. She's part of a large-scale cyber attack. Oh, God. The electric toothbrush is programmed with Java, and unnoticed criminals have installed malware on it and approximately 3 million similar toothbrushes. One command is enough, and the remote-controlled toothbrushes simultaneously access the website of a Swiss company. The site collapses and is paralyzed for hours, resulting in millions of dollars in damage. I'm so embarrassed. This example, (laughs) which seems like a Hollywood scenario, actually happened. No, it didn't. It shows how versatile digital attacks have become. Yes, even your toothbrush is not safe. (laughs) Stefan Zugerm head of the Switzerland offshoot of the cybersecurity specialist firm Fortinet said, quote, each device connected to the Internet is a potential goal or can be misused for an attack, whether baby monitor, web camera or the electric toothbrush. The attackers do not care. So the day after 
Hundreds of media outlets worldwide repeated the false claim that a botnet of three million toothbrushes had attacked a Swiss company, Fortinet, the now quite embarrassed cybersecurity firm, which was at the center of the story, issued a statement. They said, quote, <clears throat> to clarify... <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's get a little clarification. To clarify the topic of toothbrushes being used for DDoS attacks was presented during an interview as an illustration of a given type of attack. And it is not based on research from Fortinet or FortiGuard labs. It appears that due to translations... The narrative on this topic has been stretched to the point where hypothetical and actual scenarios are blurred. Wow, give that PR person a raise. That's just beautiful. It's like, well, the hypothetical and the actual met in the middle, and we're not sure where one ended and the other one started. And after all, it was lost in translation. Right. So Fortinet went on to say that its experts have, quote, not observed Mirai or other IoT botnets targeting toothbrushes or similar embedded devices. Now, Graham Cluley, who's been following this whole mess, he uh, the day after that day after on Thursday, the 8th, Graham wrote, <clears throat> I can imagine how a Fortinet researcher might have regaled a journalist with tales of how IoT devices like webcams could be hijacked into botnets for DDoS attacks. After all, this has happened. However, giving the journalist a juicy hypothetical example of millions of smart toothbrushes taking down a Swiss company is playing a dangerous game. He says, I'm not surprised that journalists seized the story. And as we've, as we've seen, then other news outlets repeated it without double checking its truth. A more experienced spokesperson would have gone to pains to make it clear that the toothbrush DDoS attack example was hypothetical and had not actually happened. Failing that, since the original article was published, get this, on January 30th, Fortinet had plenty of time to contact the Swiss newspaper and correct the report or post a clarification on social media debunking the story as the hysteria spread in the press. But Fortinet did not do that until skeptical voices in the cybersecurity community questioned the story. Ironically, Fortinet's researchers have published some genuinely interesting proof-of-concept research in the past on the toothbrush topic, albeit hacking Bluetooth-enabled toothbrushes to mess with brushing time <laughs> rather than a knock a company's website offline. So, anyway... Um, Many of the various publications that were forced to update, amend, and retract, you know, what turned out to be an erroneous story, took the time to add that, you know, like trying to cover themselves a little bit while, yes, whoops, this didn't actually happen. It was still an entirely possible and even likely scenario, except, of course, on with toothbrushes that only had Bluetooth, it actually wasn't. Um, and that, of course, that may also account, you know, the, uh, the fact that we're, we're prepared for this, that could account for the fact that everyone rushed to submit the story. You know, even though it was not true, it carried the ring of truth for any tech publication, since as everyone listening to this podcast knows, routers and security cameras and IoT devices of all makes, models, and functions are indeed being compromised and enlisted in botnets daily. It's not science fiction, even though this particularly intriguing story was pure fiction so anyway uh leo again no harm no foul and uh, uh i you know i may have picked up on it if my news gathering had been a little later in the day than it turned out to be because this as you said just happened as we were beginning the podcast so so uh, so there okay so 
I got a kick out of the blog post headline posted at the Voln, V-U-L-N, Voln Czech website. It read, there are too many damned honeypots, exclamation point. So here's what the Voln Czech guys explained. They wrote, determining the number of Internet-facing hosts Affected by a new vulnerability is a key factor in determining if it will become a widespread or emergent threat. If there are are a lot of hosts affected, there's a pretty good possibility things are about to pop off, as they put it. But if only a few hosts are available for exploitation, that's much less likely. But actually counting those hosts turns out has become quite a bit more challenging. They said, for example, take CVE 2023-22527. So that's last year. Um, This affected the Atlassian Confluence servers. They said at the time of writing, Confluence has appeared on CIS's KEV, you know, KEV, the Commonly Exploited Vulnerabilities list, 9 Yes, nine times. They, they, they wrote, that's a level of exploitation that should encourage everyone to get their Confluence servers off the Internet. But let's look for ourselves. There are a number of generic Confluence Shodan queries floating around. But X hyphen Confluence hyphen request hyphen time. So X Confluence request time might be the most well known. This simply checks for an HTTP response header being, uh, you know, being returned. In other words, okay, so breaking from them for a second, the, as we know, the Shodan Internet Search Scanner um, is constantly scanning the net uh, and aggregating the presence of of hosts on the Internet. Oh. Who's listening to what port on what IP? And in the same way that Google indexes the Internet so that it's easy to find a site by by search terms, Shodan indexes the Internet so that you're able to find vulnerable or, or at least present services by IP and type of service. So it's a, you know, it's a search engine for stuff that's listening on ports. So the the Shodan can make an HTTP query to Confluence's service port. And if the reply coming back from that port contains the reply header X Confluence request time, that strongly suggests that there's a running Confluence server answering queries at that IP and port. So the Volncheck guys then show a Shodan screen capture showing, get this, 241,702, 241702 occurrences of that reply header being returned from queries across the internet. Then they point out one particular thing. They say 241,000, you know, it's a little more than that, hosts, they said, is a great target base for an emergent threat. But on closer examination, there's something off about the listed hosts. For example, this one, and they select one, has the confluence X confluence request time header, but it also has an F5 fave icon, you know, as in the well-known security firm (laughs) F5 Systems. Uh Uh-huh. And they say it also claims to be a QNAP TS-128A, Yes. you know, uh, NAS device. They say this is a honeypot. Yeah. You know, because it's it's arranging to look like a bunch of things in order to attract flies. I got to tell you, this is something that our sponsor 
would never have done. They have so much so accurate, and they don't put their little logo in it, and they don't impersonate more than one device. So this is not right. a canary, obviously. This is some other. Right. Well, and I was thinking about this, too. Canaries are not meant to be publicly exposed. That's they're right. All, that's they're right. there for your lamb I mean, I, in order to, to detect intrusion. That's what you want. You don't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There was no reason you would stick it out there, right. you know, just to, to take incoming yeah. from the we internet. Know, we know there's bad guys out there. We don't have to yes. test for yes. that. Yeah. What we want is to find out if any of them get inside. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, the 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 Volnchek guys say whoever created this honey wat, th- this honey pot, was somewhat clever. They mashed together the popular Shodan queries for Confluence, F5 devices, and QNAP systems to create what they described as an abomination that would show <laughs> <laughs> that would show up in all three queries. To avoid throwing exploits all over the internet and thus getting quickly caught, some attackers use Shodan or similar to curate their target lists. This honeypot is optimized for this use case, oh, interesting. which is neat, but it blocks our view of what is real. Right. Can we filter them out of our search? They say at this point, it's probably useful to look at what a real Confluence server HTTP response look like. The server has a number of of other useful headers to key off of, but we'll try to filter by adding in set cookie colon J session ID equals. That update brings the host count down. Okay, so now they're saying... So th- they modify their Shodan query so that they want it to have both that that very popular X Confluence request time header and to be setting a cookie named J session ID equals. So so they're, they're they're doing an and on those two requirements, and they write that update brings the host count down from from. 241,702 to just 37,964, so just shy of 38. Um, And they call that probably actual confluence servers publicly exposed to the Internet. But is that number real? They say it still seems high because most of those do not respond with an actual confluence landing page. A simple way to capitalize on that is to also search for a snippet from the Confluence login page in our search criteria. So they add a, a another term to the Shodan query, looking for the repl- for the returned HTML to contain the phrase Confluence base URL. And they say, ah, now we're down to twenty thousand. 584, a little over half as many as before they added that additional term. And they write, this knocks off 17,000 hosts and th- things are looking more confluency. But there seems to be a whole bunch of entries without fave icons. Let's drill down into that one and see. So they do that, looking for the presence or lack of any fave icon for the site. And at one point, it occurs to them to examine the value being returned in the Confluence J Session ID cookie settings reply header. And what do you know? A great many of those across the Internet have identical values meaning they're not being generated dynamically. They're part of some fixed confluence simulating honeypot. And this and the simulation took some shortcuts. That is the simulation of the honeypot took some shortcuts, for example, randomizing the J session ID, which gives it away when it's examined closely enough. By applying this spoofed J session ID filter, the number now drops to 4,187 probably authentic 
publicly exposed Confluence servers. So again, they write and conclude. They said, a quick investigation suggests that this could be the complete set of real Confluence hosts or just very, very good honeypots. They say that's a reduction from around 240,000 hosts all the way down to just 4,200. That means there are approximately 236,000 Confluence honeypots on the Internet. That's or more than 50 times <laughs> the actual number <laughs> of Confluence users of real Confluence <laughs> servers. I'm thinking that's interesting. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, why do people want to do public honeypots? I don't get right, that. Just you know, just probably to see. Just to see. Anyway, they they say a vulnerability that only impacts 4,000 hosts is much less concerning than a vulnerability that impacts 240,000 hosts. Understanding the scale of an issue and therefore being precise about the number of potentially impacted hosts is important too. Those who copy overinflated statistics or haven't done their due diligence are making vulnerabilities appear more impactful than they truly are. Uh, Three million toothbrushes, anyone? Anyway, while we focused on Confluence, they said, this particular problem has been repeated across many different targets. Honeypots are a net good for the security community, but their expanding popularity does make understanding real-world attack surfaces much more difficult for defenders, not just attackers. And, and Leo, you, I, I really think you raise a good point. You know, we're talking a quarter of a million. That's a lot of them. Bogus <laughs> right. confluence servers. What? You uh, know, no. you're right. That's that, I don't know that, that there are that many bad Russians. It's just not as much fun to be a hacker so, as it used to be. I just. I, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this will be a very good rule of thumb for us to keep in mind moving forward. Academically, it's interesting that the explosion in honeypot use and population is this large? I mean, it's like, what? Who are all these people? You know, that's sort of astonishing. But this means that the tendency to immediately rely upon and believe the results of a simple, you know, not very critical so showdown search for a given open port assumes, you know, assuming that that means there's a truly vulnerable service running there needs to be significantly tempered. Yeah. And it also suggests that future Internet vulnerability scanners will themselves need to do a better job of filtering out the honeypots. Well, since the problem has obviously become, you know, nothing less than massive. And it might be worse even than that, because these were not well configured honeypots. I mean, any hacker worth his salt would have immediately noticed the Fortinet or whether or the F5 icon and and, and the fact that it was both a QNAP. Uh, and yeah. uh, I mean, that's a little bit, uh, you know, the whole thing doesn't ring true. And I would think most bad guys, except for script kiddies, would be sensitive to that and watching out for that. Right. Uh, there are probably many, many, many more that they can't see because they're well configured. They look just like a real Confluence server. Yep. Yep. Leo, let's take our our, our next break. Yes. And then we're going to plow into some user-driven, really interesting discussions. And again, I'm sorry about the toothbrushes. <laughs> <laughs> they're, ju they're just... <laughs> Just Bluetooth device. They Leo, I'm glad to know you're taking good care of your I teeth. I teeth are very important. Yes, they are. I should have just paid more attention. you've got a high-tech toothbrush. Hopefully it hasn't been hacked to have its running time reduced. <laughs> because <laughs> We will get to him. Someday we will kill him with tooth decay. <laughs> it may take a few years. Our show, our show today. Thank you, Steve. Brought to you by Collide. We love Collide. When you go through airport security. This is not how uh, your security probably works, but it, but it is how airport security works. You go through two lines, right? The first one, the TSA agent then checks your ID, looks at your face. Actually, nowadays they have face ID, rec face recognition machines. 
And then, uh, and then you get through that first barrier, but then you take your bags, you put them on the x-ray, and they check your, your bag. You know, in theory, the same thing happens in enterprise security, but instead of passengers and luggage, it's end users and their devices. And most companies these days are, are good at the first equation. You know, they're good at are you, you who you say you are. In fact, if you really care, you probably use an Okta, right? And that really does a good job of authentication. But then... The devices that the user's carrying with them roll right through. Well, we know you're you. We figure everything you've got is safe. That's not the case. 47% of companies allow unmanaged, untrusted devices in to access their data. That should be terrifying to you. It means an employee can log in for a laptop that, you know, doesn't have a firewall turned on or hasn't been updated in six months or is running an unpatched version of Plex from 2009. I mean, we know these things happen. Or it even could be that the laptop might belong to a bad actor who is using the employee's legitimate credentials to get in. Collide solves the device trust problem by ensuring no device can log in to your Okta-approved apps until it passes your security checks. And it's great because you can use it Collide on devices without MDM, which means on your Linux fleet, on your contractor devices, every BYOD phone and laptop in your company. Completely cross-platform. Visit collide.com slash security now. You can watch a demo. See how it works. K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash security now. This patch is a very real hole in your security. You need this thing. Collide.com slash security now. Uh, now on with the show, Steve. So, Dextra tweeted, Hello, Steve. Thank you for introducing me 13 plus years ago to the world of being security minded from a tech perspective. I travel a lot. And over the years, I've been wor working on trying to come up with a solution where I can appear on my home network so I can access and watch content on my cable provider's app while being secured with the least amount of possibility of opening my home router up to external threats. I have a Synology RT2600AC router at home. I recently started to travel with a, uh, with, with a Burl travel router. I do have an extra Synology RT2600AC router that I've traveled with in the past. Do you have any suggestions on how to go about appearing to be on my home network in a secure manner so I can access my cable provider's catalog live TV, signed RM? Okay, so this has changed over the years. Ten years ago, the standard generic answer would have been to arrange to set up a VPN server at home and then VPN into your home network from afar. That's no longer the optimal solution. Among other things, it's often more easily said than done, and it requires opening a static port through your home router, which is then visible to anyone on the Internet, like Shodan, not just you. While there are ways to do this safely, it's no longer necessary, thanks to the widespread availability of many free and terrific overlay networks. The very early such network we talked about many years ago was Hamachi. It was originally free, then it went paid, and then it was purchased by LogMeIn. It's still possible to use LogMeIn's Hamachi for $50 per year, but many free solutions exist, and they're just as good. Nebula, which was done by the, um, the stack people, TailScale, and ZeroTier are three of the very popular ones. Um, since I didn't know anything about Synology's RT2600AC router, I went over to Michael Horowitz's astoundingly useful and comprehensive routersecurity.org site. Um, it's, you know, as the name sounds, routersecurity is one word, dot org. There's just so much stuff there. His site allowed me to quickly learn that the router has some possible use as a VPN client. It builds in a VPN client, but it doesn't appear to be general purpose enough to host an over, the router itself doesn't appear to be general purpose enough to host an overlay network, you know, which any Raspberry Pi can do, for example. So this would mean that when 
when traveling, some machine inside your home network would need to be left running. But as I said, that could just be a Raspberry Pi serving as a quiet, always on, fanless network node uh, to anchor the overlay network. Then you'd run another node on your laptop, and all of these things are multi-platform. So whatever whatever OS you're carrying will be it'll be compatible, um, and th- and then you'd be all set. Essentially, your laptop and your cable provider's catalog and video streaming would see that you were connected to them from home and. This is just trouble free. Now, as I've mentioned before, what I've talked about overlaid networks and these various ones, I get people saying, "Okay, well, which one do you recommend? I can't recommend one because I have not had the need nor the chance to do this myself since I've not been traveling. But the next time I'm going to be out and about, I will make time to check out the various overlay network solutions. I can say, however, that the response from our listeners who have bitten the bullet and set up overlay networks has been like gobsmacked (laughs) positive. I mean, they can't believe they, they just, you know, they can't believe that it is that simple to obtain world-class security uh, in cross device networking through the public internet, which is anything but secure. So, you know, the day has truly arrived when it no longer needs to be difficult in order to do that. You just have to poke around. There's, you know, YouTube is full of how-to videos on overlay networks. You know, again, Nebula, Tailscale, and Zero Tier are are um, top of the list. Seems like so, uh, Tailscale is very popular. So, yes, that would be my yes. first guess. So, uh Evan, uh, uh, wow, I can't pronounce his name, uh, 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 Filier, or, ugh, sorry, Evan. Uh, anyway, he said, hey, Steve, love the show. I run an e-commerce site, and my customers have been asking for an easier way to log in. I was wondering if there are any security considerations for going passwordless via email only. Ooh. The, the system I would like to set up is registration and login via email, i.e. customer just enters their email and then receives a six-digit code in their email to authenticate and log in. Is this just as secure as email plus password authentication? Thanks. So I thought that was a really interesting yeah. and intriguing question. Yeah. Okay, so let's answer the last question first. Is this just as secure as email p- plus password authentication? At first, we might be tempted to answer no. It cannot be as secure since we've eliminated the something you know factor from the login. But of course, that's a red herring, right? Since, as I've often noted, Every login everywhere on the planet, (laughs) always and without fail, has the obligatory, I forgot my password link. Right. And and sadly, we're now also seeing, I can't use my authenticator right now. Like, oh my God, that annoys me. It's like, what? (laughs) So you don't need that really yet either. It's just kind of like, well, yeah, how about if you have it? Wow. And, you know, and I've even made this notion of the e- of the ever present email link into a joke, you know, where someone explains that they don't need no stinking password manager while they're creating an account by just mashing on their keyboard to fill in their password field. And when, when they're asked, but 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 how do you log in again later? They glibly explain that they just click on the I forgot my password link then click on the link in their email that they receive and they're logged in. The point, of course, is that so long as all username and password logins include the I forgot what I was supposed to remember, get out of jail free link, our ownership over and control of our email is the only actual security we have. Sad to say, yep. The rest is just feel-good security illusion. 
This in turn means that the service, the password, and the password manager are actually performing is only login acceleration. If your password manager is able to supply the password quickly and painlessly, then the much slower I forgot my password login process, which is always available using an email loop, can be bypassed. So it's login acceleration, which is good. As Bruce Schneier would probably describe it, quote, the password is just security theater. Oh, God. So calling passwords a login accelerant is the perfect context to put them in. This is so important. I this please everybody clip that paragraph, that previous paragraph and send it to everybody because we've said this many times the weakest link is always the the real determinant of how much security you have. And if there is a forgot my password, that's the weakest link. That's yep, the security you've got. Yep. So let's return to Evan's question. Is emailing a one-time passcode to someone who wishes to log in just as secure as using a password? It should be clear that the correct and defensible answer is yes. It's identical, if the, actually. <laughs> if the, yes. Yeah. If the users of his e-commerce site do not wish to be hassled for a password, there is no reduction in security to eliminating passwords entirely and just using an email loop. However, there's also no need for even a six-digit code since that does not provide any additional security and it's more hassle, which Evan and his users are wishing to avoid. What Evan wants to verify is that someone who is wishing to log in at this moment is in control of their previously registered email account. Remember, that's the same fallback test that's being used by every login challenge in the world. This means that all Evan needs to do is email this user a direct login link, which contains a one-time passcode as a parameter. And since the user no longer needs to transcribe it, the passcode can be as long as Evan wishes. 32 digits, no problem. The only requirement for security is that the code must be unpredictable and only valid the first time it is used. Okay, so how do we do that? Let's design the system for Evan. We'll start with a monotonically increasing 32-bit counter. That'll be good for 4.3 billion logins before it wraps around. Now, you can make it 64 bits if you like, so that the most significant 32-bit counter is incremented if the lower 32 bits should ever overflow, even though that would seem to be quite unlikely. And actually, since we're going to put a timestamp in this design also, even if it did, even if you did have 4.3 billion and it finally came around to the same, uh, you would you would no, you would not um, uh, have a valid timestamp in any event. Okay, so so we have a binary value which will never repeat since it's a simple counter that only ever counts upward and and it's stored non-volatily by the server so that you know it takes the the, the like in the registry or uh, in, in in a file so that it it writes it back and always starts even after a reboot with the next count from where it had it left off okay so we can do several things with that always incrementing binary value. It could be fed into the AES Rheindahl cipher, which is keyed with a random secret and unchanging key. That, that secret's known only to the server. It's also, you know, it might be coded into it or also written somewhere so that it's non-volatile. It never changes. Then the, the Rheindahl is a 128-bit block. So the 128 bits that comes out of the cipher, basically we, we, have, we have a random secret key which is going to encrypt our 32-bit counter into a 128-bit result. 
that, you run through a base 64 converter, those are available in every language, which produces 22 ASCII text characters. Since the encryption key will never be changed, and the input to the cipher is an upward counting counter, the output will never repeat, and it will be cryptographically unpredictable. So we've met our we've met several of our conditions. Unpredictable, never it never occurs again. So if for you know just just to explore the territory, you could take a salted hash with a secret salt. The counter value would be hashed, and then the hash's output would be similarly converted into text using base 64. Now it's true that there's an infinitesimally small chance of a hash collision where two different counter values might produce the same output. But any good hash will be cryptographically secure. And remember that any single bit which changes in the hash's input will on average change half of its output bits. So collisions there would really not be a problem, but no reason not to use Rindall. That's kind of cool anyway. Okay, so now we have a 22-character one-time token. Evan's e-commerce system should append that token to the link that's sent in the email to the individual who has just asked to log into his system. The instructions in the email are to simply click the button in the email. They do that. This confirms that someone who provided the email address is, um, is receiving email at that address and they are instantly logged in. At Evan's end, when the token is obtained and the email is sent, those two items, along with a timestamp, are added to a pending login list. A, you know, a, uh, a list in the sense of a, of a linked list in, in programming terms. Anytime someone clicks a link, the list is scanned searching for a matching token. The objects on this pending logins list should use a timestamp um, so that they are self-expiring. And the way I've organized this on my own expiring lists, of which I have many over in GRC's server, managing all the DNS stuff and shields up and everything, um, and of course this is technically called a queue, is as I'm traversing that list from its start, I'm also checking the timestamps for every object that I encounter whether or not that they match the one I'm looking for. If that object's timestamp has expired, I, I delete it from the list right then so that the list is self-pruning. When I get to the object whose token matches and if its timestamp has not expired, this confirms the, the login. I accept the, the inbound link and log this person in and remove that little object from the list. It would remove itself after it timed out anyway, but might as well, you know, keep it clean. So anyway, this simple system gives us everything we want. We have unpredictable, self-expiring, single-use tokens. That, oh, and that's the other reason to remove it from the list. As you're, as you're honoring it, and the login, you delete it from the list so that anyone who might capture it somehow is unable to, to log in again using that, that token, which has, is meant to be single use. Um, uh, Evan's users no longer need to mess with a password. They simply go to a login page, enter their previously registered email address, click the email me a button, open the email that they received, click the button, and they're in. No passwords to worry about, and every bit as secure, actually, as if a password being used. It's If you have a password manager, then you have, you're able to use on sites that support passwords, you're able to use that as an accelerant to logging in. But it doesn't make you any more secure, and you could argue if it's a poor password, it could make you even less secure. And that's the danger, right? Passwords that are bad allow bad guys to brute force. If you don't have a password, 
there's nothing to brute force. So you can make the argument that a passwordless login is even more secure than a system that did have passwords. Yikes. But a really great question. I think. Yeah. I mean, yeah, really, you, you got me thinking. A lot it's of it's counterintuitive, like, isn't it? Yeah. Medium uses that. They don't have passwords. It's sort of annoying because um, it means I have to go to my email every time I want to log in. Exactly. But and 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 Evan is suggesting that his users would rather do that yeah, than than have to remember that. a password. Yeah. So I'm seeing that more and more often on sites like Medium, where you just don't set up a password. It's uh, you just you just say email me, uh, microblog. Well, is that too. And uh, we're about to encounter that because that what you're describing is the. Uh, is the unintended consequence that w that was yet last week's topic of sites asking for your email because they want to replace right. first person tracking uh, because third person tracking is going away. Right, 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 right. Anyway, we'll, we'll get there in a second. Margrave said, hey, Steve, I've been a loyal listener since the early days and thought, and though I'm not a security expert, I work in software quality automation and have found the Security Now podcast incredibly helpful several times. I recently created a link I recently created a LinkedIn article and was given the option to share it on social media. When I chose Facebook, I encountered an interesting situation. I remembered changing my password, but it struck me as odd that Facebook would notify me about it. And in his in, in, in his message to me, he included a screenshot that of what he encountered, where it, it's a Facebook pop-up says, log into your Facebook account to share. And then it says, you entered an old password. Your password was changed about two weeks ago. If you don't remember making this change, click here. And then it prompts him for his current password. So then he says... He continues, I'm not entirely sure if this is a positive or a negative feature for Facebook. Sure, Facebook is often filled with a lot of random stuff like pictures of cats in sunglasses, chickens wearing hats, breathtaking sunsets from someone's backyard and other equally ridiculous images. But this made me ponder the implications of such notifications. I'm curious to hear your thoughts as well as those of other listeners on this feature Facebook is offering. I'm also eagerly awaiting SpendRight 6.1. It's been a fantastic tool, and I appreciate all the other facets of your podcast, including your involvement with vitamin D3. Best regards, Tom. You know, okay, part so of this is because Facebook, which was originally for college kids, exactly 20 years ago, by the way, it launched, is now primarily for old folks. <laughs> People like you and me who forget our yep. passwords, who change our passwords and forget we changed our passwords, things like yep. that, and who are often, often hacked. I think Facebook accounts are most often hacked. I mean, very, very common. So I don't see, to answer Tom's question, any downside to this. And given that Facebook, exactly as you said, Leo, caters to the people who are taking and posting those images, <laughs> which do not which do not impress Tom, uh, I can see the merit in reminding someone when their password was changed and then for whatever reason they entered their earlier password. I think more um, sites are going to be like this, to be honest with you, as we yeah. age. Yeah, yeah and in yeah. fact, you know, to demonstrate that, in Tom's case, this was useful to him. He did recall having changed his password several weeks before but for whatever reason, he entered his earlier password. The alternative to having Facebook helpfully saying, hey, you entered an old password, would be, sorry, that password is incorrect. This would be more confusing than having Facebook re recognize and helpfully report that the password was the user's attempted use of an earlier password. You know, and, and I don't know whether multiple people in a household routinely share a single Facebook account. Oh, that's account. a good point, yeah. But if so, one of them might have changed their shared password and failed to inform the others. So this would be a huge help in that instance. The only problem I can see would arise if Facebook were to honor 
Tom's use of his retired password, but that would obviously or hopefully never happen. So I don't see any downside. And we know that those really annoying systems require their users to periodically change their passwords for no reason and then also refuse to allow any recently used password to be reused. And, you know, they are so that means they are similarly storing previous password hashes. So the practice of remembering previous password hashes is not new. Um, I think this amounts to a useful and user-friendly feature. Good um, and and secure, which is what he's yes, really worried yes, about. That's great. Exactly. That's I don't see yeah. any any problem for for security. Good. Um, gimmicks three. He says, "Hey Steve, I've been thinking about this thing that now we'll be able to choose our browser in iOS." And whilst I'm excited to be able to run Firefox in my iPhone, I'm feeling a bit uneasy. Safari, by being imposed on iOS and the default on macOS, has gained popularity over the years and has been too big to ignore until now. Are we going back to the days of the hegemony of Chrome and websites that can only be used on Chrome? So I thought about this for a while, and I would say that it's really up to the other browsers. All of the standards that Chrome, obviously and currently the global dominant browser for here and for the foreseeable future, the standards that Chrome is using are open, open source, and available for adoption by anyone. It may indeed be that if they wish to retain what market share they can, they will need to adopt the same set of open standards that Chrome has. These next few years are going to be really interesting. The only place where Apple is being forced to allow third-party browser engine cores is the EU. And we know that Apple is infuriated by this interference with their sovereignty over their own platform. So it seems unlikely that Apple will similarly be, be opening their devices to other browsers browsers elsewhere also the internet as a whole appears to finally be maturing waking up and sobering up a bit you know we're seeing things tightening up everywhere advertising is pulling back sites that never had a clear and justifiable reason for their own existence yet we're carrying a huge overhead with a plan to well make it up in volume you know they're disappearing what a shock so in today's climate i cannot see anyone willfully turning away visitors who come surfing in from any platform you know, perhaps internal corporate sites might force their employees to use some specific browser in order to run their poorly designed software that, that will only run on a specific browser. But that's their fault. I, that is never going to happen as a general rule. No matter what happens on the platforms side, especially with the, with the web standardization process so well established today, I doubt we're ever going to see any public sites you know, certainly none that plan to survive telling their users that they must go get another browser. That's I think those days are over. Yeah. And and really, those were written by or, or, you know, those days were largely back when browsers were incapable of doing everything. And so it was, you know, go get Flash, download Flash if you want to use this site. And, and as we know, entire sites were, were, were once written in Flash, which, you know, was crazy. So any browser that wouldn't run Flash wouldn't be able to run that site. Barbara says, it occurs to me that the third CISA recommendation that might address universal plug and play issues. If UPnP is on and malware tries to open ports, the user would be notified, right? <clears throat> okay, so Barbara's referring to CISA's third recommendation, which we discussed last week, about configuration changes to the router or network device requiring a manual, oh, changes which affected security requiring a manual 
intervention by the user of some kind, like them going over and pressing a button saying, you know, enable me to make changes to this router. And she raises a very good point about UPnP, which we know is a real security problem. But I'm afraid that's not what CISA was referring to. And there's really no good way to deal with that particular problem. UPnP is so ubiquitous that all of today's routers enable it by default, out of the box. Otherwise, things break. And since it's not the router's fault when UPnP is abused, there's no downside for the router to default to having it enabled, as they all do. The last thing any router manufacturer wants is for some online reviewer to write up that they swapped in this router and a bunch of things that were working before broke. You know, the fact that it broke because the router's more secure will be lost on the audience. So the value of UPnP for providing hands-free connectivity is is you know which is what it does it, um, is that it needs no management interface that you know it's just magic unfortunately it's magic is black and it is certainly prone to abuse because it allows anything on the internal network without any authentication barriers of any kind to create static incoming port mappings to whatever devices are chosen. Because UPnP's totally freewheeling nature by design, there's no way to require any sort of manual intervention. You know, today's network devices just expect it to be, you know, UPnP to be there and for uh, and for their network traffic to be able to come and go as they please. And unfortunately, secure it is not. Um, Guillermo Garcia said, hey, Steve, listening to SN 960 and your explanation on the reaction and workaround to Google's protected audience solution. I have two comments. If this registration requirement is widely adopted, I'm wondering how that will affect the indexing spiders that index the web for us. And then I wonder what kind of password reuse nightmare will emerge if a login is required for every website on the web. I thought those were two good points. And the second of those two questions occurred to me last week. If we're being asked to create what are essential, essentially throwaway accounts just for the privilege of visiting websites, then why not use a throwaway password? Come up with something that probably meets modern password requirements and reuse it for sites that just don't matter. The problem, of course, is that there will probably be some tendency to keep using that password even on sites that are not throwaway. So this reuse for convenience is instilling a very bad habit, which, you know, we spent the last decade training everyone out of. And this would also render our password manager's web checkup features useless since they would be freaking out over all of our deliberate password reuse. As for spiders, I hadn't considered that, and I wonder how that works today, since news sites behind paywalls appear to be indexed. One thought would be that the user agent header, which identifies a spider, might be checked by the site. But of course, that would be easy for anyone to spoof in order to get past the paywall just like the spider does. I suppose that the IP address blocks from which spiders crawl are likely well known and fixed. Or you could do reverse DNS on the IP to see if like it comes it's coming in from Google from a Google, you know, dot com property. You know, and of course, IP addresses cannot be spoofed. So it would be possible to admit un incoming requests from a set of previously well-known IP ranges without requiring a gratuitous login first. But having said that, there's really no reason why spiders could not just log in like everyone else. I'm sure that assuming this comes to pass, the problem of keeping the web indexed will be solved somehow. And what we're about to learn is that it turns out no password required. And that's the solution, just like you mentioned, Leo, for, for Medium. 
Earl Rod tweeted, regarding unintended consequences and websites requiring an account to view their content. I first encountered this a few weeks ago and wondered why. It clearly was not a paywall. Now I understand why. Referring to last week's podcast, he said, in fact, no password is needed since it's not an account, but merely a way to track me. They did verify that my email was a real one. So the friction for a user is minimal. Really nothing to remember except my junk email, which I have for such purposes. He said, P.S. The site was foxnews.com. He says, one of the several entertainment sites I look at to see the going narratives related to the news. Okay, so first of all, it's very interesting that no password is needed. And Earl is correct. The only thing they really want and need is our email address. That's what they're trying to get. I went over to Fox News and poked around a bit, and I was not initially prompted for anything. I noticed in the URL bar that Firefox was saying that I had given the Fox site some special permissions of some sort. It turned out that I had disabled autoplay and audio was blocked on that site. So I cleared any cookies that Firefox might have been carrying, and then, sure enough, I got the same thing Earl reported. I put a, I, I grabbed a picture of it by myself for for the show notes, and it's 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 a um, it's a box that says join Fox News for access to this content. It says plus get unlimited access to thousands of articles, videos, and more with your free account. Then there's a, a, a form to fill in, you know, just a one liner. Enter your email and then a continue button. And then in the fine print below, it says, by entering your email, you're agreeing to Fox News terms of service and privacy policy, which includes our notice of financial incentive. That's bold. (laughs) To access the content, check your email and follow the instructions provided. Okay, so um, they do that. that pay that 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 page fade effect where you can see the top of the story right. but it fades to right. white you know and so that it becomes unreadable right. while this box appears um so I was curious about the notice so and so in other words you know you can't really continue reading the story until you've entered your email, click the button, gone to your email, click the link there to confirm your email address. All of that gives your browser a cookie, which is now tied to your email address. So every time you come back in the future, they know who you are. So I was curious about this this notice of financial incentive they referred to. Yeah, what so I be? followed the wow. link, which brought me to the following disclosure. Under notice of financial incentive, it says... This notice applies to our offers or programs, uh, parens, each an incentive program that that link to this section of our privacy policy. Uh, okay, and of course the page blocking e- that that email um, that brought me here linked to this, so it it applies to what we just did, right? And which California may consider to be a financial incentive. You can opt in to participate in an incentive program by providing your email address or other personal information. In exchange for providing your personal information and depending on the incentive program in which you participate, you may be able to access certain content features or events, receive a discounted price on an applicable subscription, or receive special news alerts or other entitlements. We will in turn, use your personal information for the purposes set forth in this privacy policy, such as sending you alerts and marketing messages and personalizing your experience, including providing advertising you may find more relevant and interesting. 
to the extent we can estimate the value of your personal information to us, we consider the value of the offer, such as special content or features, the cost to us associated with providing the offer. In other words, right, it's a net zero, it's a net equal, and the potential benefit to us in the form of advert of additional advertising or other revenue we may receive as a result of you using our services. The value to us, if any, will depend on the extent to which you engage with our services, which, boy, you know, some attorneys made a bunch of money putting those couple paragraphs together. Basically, what this amounts to is you've given us your email address, which we're going to use to enrich ourselves. <laughs> and the more you, more time you spend here, the richer we get. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's, and, and, you know, every, all the sites that are doing this are, are say the same thing. It's very clear that this is exactly what Earl who first encountered this suggested it was. I don't visit the Fox News site often enough to have, particip- to have appreciated this as a change of behavior recently, but apparently Earl does, and it changed for him. Yeah, it's this is the, new. The CCPA, I bet, is that financial. The California uh, Privacy Act is right. the financial one. Uh, right. But yeah, it makes sense. You know what? We don't need a password. You don't need no stinking password. Nope. Just give us your email. So, uh, That's you know, all we ask. I as, see that a lot, as he, by the way. Yep. Yeah. As he put it, I first encountered this a few weeks ago and wondered why. You know, it's not obnoxious, and the fa- and the lack of any request for a password makes it much less obnoxious. Right. So it looks like we have a perfect example of last week's topic, the unintended consequences of trying to take tracking away from an industry that does not want to let it go. Everyone who fills out these join our site online forms, aside from subjecting themselves to an ever-increasing torrent of spam, will be receiving a completely legal and legitimate first-party browser cookie to uniquely identify them to the site and tie it to to their email address. So long as their browser returns that cookie during that and subsequent visits, they will be seen as a member of the site, so they won't be bothered again. This is a one-time deal. However, yes, the site with members come advantages, right? The site will in turn forward the visitor's email address to all partners, including all advertisers on that site, who will effectively be paying them, be paying the site for that information. You know, before I had switched away from the site, by the way, uBlock Origins blocked access attempt count was up to 98 different (laughs) domains. Oh, my God. That has to be a record. Holy cow. 98. Oh, and boy. You're going to start getting there's some pillow ads real it. soon in your email, I think. Yep. There's more evidence of this. As I was researching the the title story for today, the, the trusted platform module BitLocker decryption story, I scrolled down on the PCGamer.com site, and I encountered exactly the same thing. PC Gamer Newsletter. Sign up to get the best content of the week and great gaming deals as picked by the editors. And there it is. And then there's two checkboxes that were not default checked, which I at least appreciated. That was contact me with news and offers from other future brands and receive email from us on behalf of our trusted partners or sponsors. Yikes. And then, same fine print. By submitting your information, you agree to the terms and conditions and privacy policy and are aged 16 or over. So, uh, you know... One thing I didn't mention last week during our discussion of this is that if anyone doesn't yet have a throwaway junk email account, now would certainly be a good time to establish one. No site to whom we provide this email address will be respecting our privacy. That's the entire point 
of obtaining our email address. It's so that our privacy can be more explicitly ignored than ever before. And note that we are also implicitly agreeing now to every such site's privacy policy, which should be renamed their lack of privacy policy. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, even if you use a burner email, they don't care. It's a fingerprint. So yep, you know, exactly. It's, it, you don't exactly. have to, even it, the it burner all email. Ties really, back to, yeah. It all ties back to you. It's marginally better, I guess. Now, I have to ask you one thing. In this screenshots, I see a LastPass icon. Are you still using LastPass? I thought you got, you stopped using LastPass. Uh, that's a good point. Is this, On this computer, is this, I think I must not have uninstall it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right. Yeah. Just mentioning. Very oh, that's your point. that's your screenshot computer. Probably not right. your main machine. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's yeah. off off the net. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so it's we're an hour and 14. We're at a good point. Let's do our last break, and then we're going to finish with a couple questions and talk about the TPM issue. TPM, the topic, as we continue on Security Now right after this. This episode brought to you by Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood is the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement, thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of Q1 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker-dealer. All okay. right. Thank you, Robinhood, for your support for Security Now. On we go with TPM, Mr. Gibson. <laughs> Okay, so Tom Walker tweeted, Hi, Steve. Years ago, you mentioned that you leave your phone plugged in all the time. Do you still do that? Just curious if, in your experience, that has kept the phone battery healthy. Ah. Now, I do keep my phones charged up all the time. I have an iPhone X that is uh, stuck to an electromagnetic charging stand at either uh, my day or evening location. Otherwise, it's in my pocket when I'm out or between locations. But the moment I return home, I walk right to the charger and it docks. Separately, I also keep an older iPhone 7 that my wife retired uh, right here next to me uh, as my desk phone. And as we can see in the video, uh, it is never unplugged. It is essentially a corded phone. Uh, and I have three iPads, which I use daily. Each similarly is always plugged in. Now I can't claim to have any clear experimental evidence that this helps the batteries to live longer. The science all says that today's lithium cycle batteries do not like to be deep discharged, but neither do they like to be overcharged. Oh, they don't like that at all. They much prefer to be kept nearer to their fully charged state. And I assume that Apple understands all of this and is doubtless very careful not to overcharge their devices. So leaving them connected is safe. One thing I can say is that my devices always outlive their batteries. That is, I never have batteries die on any of my things. So there's one data point. Another is that I have a friend of many years who used to allow his Apple devices to discharge fully before plugging them in. Um, he was he was remembering the, the, the previous nickel cadmium 
battery admonishments to always deep discharge that type of battery chemistry, NICAD, uh, to avoid the famous memory effect where NICADs that were only partially discharged a little bit before they were recharged would start thinking that they were empty at that point where they had been recharged. Anyway, he killed one Apple device after another <laughs> until I noticed. I mean, he, he and he complained to me. He says these darn Apple devi- <laughs> these batteries are no good, and I noticed that his battery symbol was red and like screaming for his attention. It was in pain, oh. and I explained that plugging them in at every opportunity is the way to treat lithium cycle batteries. I think also so, you can trust companies these days to manage their batteries very well, especially Apple. Because uh, Apple actually has traditionally smaller batteries than some of the other companies in their phones. And so they're very, they're constantly tweaking everything to make sure they get maximum. Well, power. yes, but the problem is if you refuse to plug it in and yeah. you insist on, on, on <laughs> using it, there's, there's no nothing way around Apple that. can do. There's nothing no. to do about that. If you're going to discharge well, all the way, yeah. Yeah, just uh, my, I guess what I'm saying is my advice is generally to people just let the, f- don't worry about it. Let the phone do its thing. Devices these days are pretty good about all that stuff. I would say, I mean, I've, I, it, it took a long time to train my wife to plug her phone in if there was no reason not to. Right. That is, it's better to have it on power than not. Because, right. you know, if I, if you don't have the habit, it's easy to leave, leave it lying around. Then you grab it when you're running out the door and it's already low and it's not going to last long and it's just not good for it. So anyway, for what it's worth, I, I just, you know, I, I keep everything charged up. Um, Mark Jones said, hey, Steve, I know you get no spam, but would like your advice on email deliverability. I, too, am an old timer and maintained websites with email for decades. You have not do- you have not commented on how hard email deliverability is in the age of SPF, DKIM and DMARC. You also haven't offered advice about maintaining your own email server. February 2024, that's now, marks changes for both how Google and Yahoo regard appropriate settings. What's your take? Costs continue to escalate for services that interpret delivery failure events. Easy DMARC was free for multiple sites at one point, now only free for one, and paid plan is more than I pay per month for shared hosting. Is it time to give up running email off my own domains? Okay, so... I've not commented upon the difficulty of email delivery in the age of SPF, DKIM, and DMARC because I've not yet tried ramping up GRC's rate of mail delivery. I do run my own email server, and it fully supports all three sender verification standards. They're all configured and running, and GRC has been trickling email in and out of its domain for years with never a hint of any trouble. So it occurred to me there's some chance that I may have already established more of a positive reputation than I was worried might be needed. You know, it's not as if I'm the email that will begin coming from me will will emerge from some never before seen domain, uh, you know, and suddenly, you know, bulk email starts going out. So anyway, we'll see how it goes. And I will absolutely 100 percent share everything I encounter along the way. But Mark concluded his note with the question, is it time to give up running email off my own domains? And I think that's a question only he can answer. But from what he mentioned of escalating costs for something called Easy DMARC, for example, it doesn't sound as though he's running his own email server. Yeah. So he's incurring additional service costs. I am running my own email server, so I have zero cost associated with hosting email environments. Well, and so, I'm going to, you, you know, our sponsor, uh, 
Fast Mail will do all the D Kim D Mark and SPF for you on your domains. By the way, I have my own. All my email comes to my own personal domain. I don't have Gmail or Yahoo or Outlook, or anything like that. It's all Leoville right. or whatever. And I do right. all the the uh, MX records are all through Fast Mail. They do all of the authentication. Um, nice. I don't see any reason. I think if he's asking the question, should I run my own server? Only if you're Steve Gibson. You got to be <laughs> nuts to run your own email server. That's just. Uh, for one thing, you don't use, you're not using consumer IP addresses. Uh, anybody who has an ISP based IP address, forget your email ever getting through. Yeah. You're, you, you, you lease level three addresses, right? You have, you have right. commercial addresses. I and have you've a been using a block of 24. And you've been using them for so long that they've never been used for spams. So right. you're not on any blacklist or, I mean, this is, Steve is an unusual case. Very few people should be running their own servers. Domain's different. Servers don't do that. Don't do that. That's crazy. <laughs> I like it. That's crazy. <laughs> well, you're fine now, right? Because for whatever reason, you know, you're you're those addresses are safe, and you're doing all the right authentication, so you're fine. Right. Right. Um, Max Feinleib, Fe Feinleib said, "Thank you so much for sharing." Uh, at a Brentley's tip about checking iOS app sizes. He says, I just deleted over 10 gig <laughs> off my phone. Yeah, these in, sizes are giant. In, what's, in what seems to be nothing but cruft. It's terrible. So, so, so for anyone who's interested, remember, you know, go, go through, look at the sizes of the data, and if it doesn't make sense to you, delete the app and reinstall it. And none of that crap will come back. Yeah. That really, you, Leo, it really is wrong. I'm surprised that Apple doesn't have like a, you know, a, a space cleaner. On the other hand, they don't mind selling you larger memory for uh, more money. If you've yeah, I mean, a lot nothing. of the so. other stuff is stuff like uh, attachments in your messages and things. And those get big. And, you yeah. know, they're not going to delete those willy-nilly. They're going to, you know, they presume that you want them. Yeah, until you delete them. And I wish they yeah, did have a way of doing it, but they don't. Yeah. You know. Andre Arroyo, he said at SGGRC, this was a public tweet. He said, Spinrite 6.1 release candidate six running directly on my old iMac and booting off USB. He said, I couldn't do this before. Now it's easy. Thanks for Spinrite and Security Now. Ooh. And I, I put a big picture in the show notes just because it was very cool to see uh, Spinrite sitting there proudly on his on his iMac screen. It's now, how cool. does he do that? That's a that's a that's a advanced tip. Yeah, you 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 uh, uh, you know uh, if you're able to boot from USB, that's all it takes. Okay, and yeah, run and, and, and this is obviously an Intel iMac. It's not. It's got to be an Intel yeah, iMac. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yep. Because you have to be able to run this. Uh, you're still using FreeDOS right now, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. But next yep. time it'll be this other DOS that you that you own practically. Yep, the RTOS. <laughs> the <Yep>. last user. <laughs> I, I bought it as the sink was ship as the sink as the ship, ship was, was sinking. sinking. <laughs> hey, I'll take it off your hands. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'll buy it. I'll buy it. So speaking of Spinrite, I am as I had hoped at work on Spinrite's documentation now, while Spinrite's paint continues to dry. Uh for example, one user in GRC's forums who had a dying SDHC SD card with a large non-critical file wanted to experiment with its recovery. So here's what he wrote. He said, hi, Steve. I'd like to know if there is a way to have Spinrite perform an operation like a level two scan multiple times. The reason I ask is that I have a Samsung 32 gig SDHC card that has a couple of spots it cannot read or write to. I was able to copy all the files except one large one off it. He says, parens, an MP4 phone video I took that's not important. And I decided to play with it to see if it's recoverable. The card passes the Spinrite Level 2 test, but does not pass Level 3 in two areas where I get a device fault error. The really interesting thing about this is that in running level two a number of times, I've been able to heal some of the bad spots and increase the amount of the file being copied using Windows from 60% to 86%. 
My thought is, if I was able to have Spinrite do the level two scan overnight multiple times, it might just heal any remaining bad spots. Okay, so the first thing I explained in my reply to him was that Spinrite can now be completely controlled from its command line. So it would be possible to start it with a command that will bypass any user interaction, select the proper drive and processing level, run spin right over the drive, then exit back to DOS once that's done. At that point, it's a simple matter to create a DOS command script, which of course DOS refers to as batch files, that jumps back up to loop to repeat the command over and over until it's interrupted. So it would just be running sp uh, level two over and over and over, which, you know, is uh, apparently good for that drive. The reason I'm mentioning this is that SpinWrite's user can interrupt anything SpinWrite is doing at any time. But if the user then manually exited to DOS in this situation, that the batch file will still be in control and would immediately restart SpinWrite. It would be possible to exit SpinWrite, then, you know, frantically hit Control C over and over and over to attempt to get DOS's attention and break out of the loop, but that's certainly inelegant. So, when programs exit, this is all programs everywhere, a nearly universal convention is that they will return an exit code to whatever invoked them. This code can signify whatever the program wishes, which is typically the program's sort of generic success or failure. Today, SpinWrite exits with a zero exit code unless it's unable to parse its command line, in which case it exits with a one. So what occurred to me while answering his question uh, is that when, it, when SpinWrite is exiting automatically due to the exit verb on its command line, and not because of a manual intervention, it could exit with an error code of two. This would allow for much more graceful infinite loop termination by using the DOS line if error level 2 go to scan at the bottom of the batch file. Anyway, that way it would loop, and when you use the escape key to get out of spin right, it would drop back out and break out of the loop elegantly. So anyway, uh, at some point, when my eyes are crossing from writing documentation all day, I'll take a break from that to add this a tiny little additional convenience feature. And this is the great advantage of having some time to let the paint dry. SpinWrite is done. It's working perfectly. No one is encountering any new errors. And again, it's like it's done. But there's still time for some minor touch-ups. Uh, and history has shown that once I finally do release it as SpinWrite 6.1 and have started working on its successor, I'm going to be extremely reluctant to mess with it any further. So now is the perfect time for those last little tweaks while I'm working on the documentation and getting it ready for the world. Nice. How exciting. That That's is, great. really. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so BitLocker, chipped or cracked? The number one most sent to me news item of the past week. <laughs> wow. It was like everybody did yeah. seen this, seen this, seen this. Oh, yeah. Um, was the revelation that PCs whose secret key storage trusted platform module functions are provided by a separate TPM chip outside of the main CPU are vulnerable to compromise by someone with physical access to the machine. This came as a surprise to many people who assumed that this would not be the case and that their mass storage systems were more protected than they turn out to be by Microsoft's BitLocker. During system boot up, the small unencrypted startup portion of Windows sees that BitLocker is enabled and configured on the machine and that the system has a TPM chip which contains the the decryption key. 
So that pre-boot code says to the TPM chip, hey there, I need the super secret encryption key that you're holding. And the TPM chip replies, yeah, got it right here. Here it comes, no problem. And then sends it over to the processor. The only glitch here is that anyone with a hardware probe is able to connect the probe to the communicating chips of the processor or the TPM chip, or perhaps even to the traces on the printed circuit board, which interconnect those two if those traces happen to lie on the surface. Once connected, the computer can be booted, and that entire happy conversation can be passively monitored. Neither end of the conversation will be any the wiser, and the probe is able to intercept and capture the TPM chip's reply to the processor's request for the BitLocker decryption key. These are the sorts of tricks that the NSA not only knows about, but has doubtless taken advantage of who knows how many times. But it's not made more widely obvious until a clever hacker, like this s s stack smashing guy, that was his handle, comes along and shines a very bright light on it. So it's a wonderful thing that he did. And I should note that this is not the first time this has come to light. Uh, it happened a few years ago and a few years before that. So it's the kind of thing that surfaces every so often and people go, what? Oh, my God. Okay, the fundamental weakness in the design is that the TPM's key storage and the consumer of that stored key are located in separate components whose communication pins are readily accessible. And the obvious solution to this dilemma is to integrate the TPM's storage functions into the system's processor so that their highly sensitive communication remains internal and inaccessible to casual eavesdropping. And, as it turns out, that's exactly what more recent Intel and AMD processors have done. So this inherent vulnerability to physical attack occupies a window in time where discrete TPM modules exist and are being maybe overly depended upon for their security and before their functions had been integrated into the CPU. It's also unclear, like just broadly, whether all future CPUs will always include a fully integrated TPM or whether Intel and AMD will only do this for some higher end models or perversely, it turns out, some lower end models. Anyway, all of this created such a stir in the industry that yesterday on Monday the 12th, Ars Technica posted a very nice piece about the whole issue under and under the subhead what PCs are affected, the Ars guy wrote, BitLocker is a form of full disk encryption that exists mostly to prevent someone who steals your laptop from taking the drive out, sticking it into another system, and accessing your data without requiring your account password. In other words, they're unable to start up your laptop, so they just take the hard drive out and stick it in a different machine, which they know how to start up. Many modern Windows 10 and 11 systems, they write, use BitLocker by default. When you sign into a Microsoft account in Windows 11 Home or Pro on a system with a TPM, your drive is typically encrypted automatically, and a recovery key is uploaded to your Microsoft account. In a Windows 11 Pro system, you can turn on BitLocker manually whether you use a Microsoft account or not. Back, backing up the recovery key any way you see fit. They say, regardless, a potential BitLocker exploit could affect the personal data on millions of machines. So how big of a deal is this new example of an old attack? For many individuals, the answer is probably not very. One barrier to entry for attackers is technical. Many modern systems use firmware TPM modules, or FTPMs, 
that are built directly into most processors. I think all AMD in, systems do that, right? Right. Yeah. In, in cheaper machines, he writes, this can be a way to save on manufacturing. Why buy a separate chip if you could just use a feature of the CPU you're already paying for? In other systems, including those that advertise compatibility with Microsoft's Pluton security processors, it's marketed as a security feature that specifically integrates these kinds of so-called sniffing attacks. That's because there's no external communication bus to sniff for an FTPM. It's integrated into the processor. So any communication between the TPM and the rest of the system also happens inside the processor. Virtually all self-built Windows 11 compatible desktops will use FTPMs, as will modern budget desktops and laptops. We checked four recent sub $500 Intel and AMD laptops from Acer and Lenovo, all used firmware TPMs. Ditto for four self-built desktops with motherboards from Asus Gigabyte and ASRock. Ironically, if you're using a high-end Windows laptop, your laptop is slightly more likely to be using a dedicated external TPM chip, which means you might be vulnerable. The easiest way to tell what type of TPM you have is to go into the Windows Security Center, go to the Device Security screen, and click Security Processor Details. If your TPM's manufacturer is listed as Intel for Intel systems or AMD for AMD systems, you're most likely using your system's FTPM. And this exploit won't work on your system. The same goes for anything with Microsoft listed as the TPM manufacturer, which generally means the computer uses Pluton. But if you see another manufacturer listed, that is not Intel, AMD, or Microsoft, you're probably using a dedicated external TPM. He said, I saw STM microelectronics TPMs, that's a very popular one, in a recent high-end Asus ZenBook, Dell XPS 13, and mid-range Lenovo ThinkPad. Stack smashing the guy who publicized this again, you know, reminded everybody of this, also posted photos of a ThinkPad X1 Carbon Gen 11 with a hardware TPM and all the pins someone would need to try to nab the encryption key as evidence that not all modern systems has switched over to FTPMs, admittedly something I had initially assumed, he wrote. Laptops made before 2015 or 2016 are, are all virtually guaranteed to be using external hardware TPMs when they have any. That's not to say FTPMs are completely infallible. Some security researchers have been able to defeat the firmware TPMs in some of AMD's processors with, quote, two to three hours of physical access to the target device, unquote. Firmware TPMs just aren't susceptible to the kind of physical Raspberry Pi-based attack that Stack Smashing demonstrated. Okay, so there is some good news here, at least in the form of what you can do if you really need and want the best possible protection. It's possible to add a pin to the boot up process even now so that the additional factor of something you know can be used to strongly resist TPM only attacks. Microsoft provides a couple of very good and extensive pages which focus upon hardening BitLocker against attacks. I've included links to those articles in the show notes, but to give you a sense for the process of adding a pin to your system right now, ours explains under their subhead, so what can you do about it? 
They say most individual users don't need to worry about this kind of attack. Many consumer systems don't use dedicated TPM chips at all. And accessing your data requires a fairly skilled attacker who's very interested in pulling the data off your specific PC rather than wiping it and reselling or stripping it for parts. He says this is not true of business users who deal with confidential information on their work laptops, but their IT departments hopefully do not need to tell anyone to do that. Okay, so if you want to give yourself an extra layer of protection, Microsoft recommends setting up an enhanced pin that is required at startup in addition to the theoretically sniffable key that the TPM provides. IT admins can enable this remotely via group policy. To enable it on your own system, open the local group policy editor using, you know, Windows R to, to open the run and then type gpedit.msc, hit enter. Then navigate to computer configuration, administrative templates, Windows components, BitLocker driver encryption, and operating system drives. Enable both the require additional authentication at startup and allow enhanced pins for start for for startup. Then open a command prompt window as an admin and type manage hyphen BDE hyphen protectors hyphen add C colon hyphen TPM and pin. That command, and this is all in the show notes, of course, that command will immediately prompt you to set a pin for the drive. I would think of it as a password. Anyway, he says, once you've done this, the next time you boot, the system will ask for a pin before it boots into Windows. He says, an attacker with physical access to your system and a sufficient amount of time may be able to gain access by brute forcing this pin. So it's important to make it complex, like any good password. And again, I would make it really good if you're taking the time to do it at all. Why not? He, see, he finishes, a highly motivated, technically skilled attacker with extended physical access to your device may still be able to find a way around these safeguards. Regardless, having disk encryption enabled keeps your data safer than it would be with no encryption at all. And, that's, and, and that will be enough to deter lesser skilled casual attackers from being able to get at your stuff. So ultimately... We're facing the same trade-off as always, convenience versus security. In the absence of a very strong PIN password, anyone using a system that is in any way able to decrypt itself without their assistance should recognize the inherent danger of that. If the system escapes their control, bad guys might be able to arrange to have the system do the same thing for them. That is, decrypt without anything that they don't know. Requiring something you know is the only true protection. Maybe something else that you have, if, you, if that could be arranged. That's the, uh, what I did when I did my little European trip to, in, in, to introduce Squirrel, is I, I had my my laptop, you know, linked to my phone and my iPhone had to be present at the same time, bit locking or bit lockering a drive is certainly useful since it will provide, you know, it will strongly prevent anyone who separates the drive from the machine from obtaining anything that's protected in any way. So bit locker. Yes. Pin. Yes. And as we've seen, it's possible to add a pin after the fact and if your pin is weak, you can still strengthen it, and you should consider doing so. Do we still uh, like Veracrypt? Would you prefer Veracrypt to BitLocker? BitLocker is so convenient, uh, but it's convenient, and Veracrypt is a hundred percent strong. Um, yeah. I was thinking the same thing. BitLocker suffers a little bit from the, you know. The the, the 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 monoculture effect right. of everybody having it and it just being built in. On the other hand, it, its convenience means that it won't get in anyone's way. Right. Yeah, you just log in the computer as normal. Yeah. Yeah. 
But if you wanted really better security, I think VeraCrypt is. We still I, that's still our our choice. Now yep. that now that bit what was it? Uh, its predecessor, I forgot now. Beak, what was it? Uh, tr uh, TrueCrypt. TrueCrypt true, 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 is true gone. Crypt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. All right. If your pin is weak, you can still straighten it. The motto of the day. <laughs> if the pin is weak, you can still straighten it. I like it, Leo. <laughs> That's Kalia, who is a textile worker. Uh, thank you very much, Steve Gibson. You are the best. We reward Steve, don't we, by all joining Club Twit. Let's not forget. Let's not forget. That's the best way to support this show and all the shows we do. Steve's pledged going to four digits. But we might, you can't really do it if the lights are out and the cameras are shut down. So come on down to Club Twit, twit.tv slash Club Twit. You get all the shows ad free, the Discord, all the benefits for $7. If you just want to support this show, $2.99 a month, $2.99 a month will uh, support any individual show. But I think for a few bucks more, you might as well support them all because I think everything uh, we do on the network is, is of value. I hope it is uh, to your work or to just your understanding of how technology works. Steve lives at grc.com. That's where SpinRight 6 also lives, soon to be 6.1, like a butterfly. It's it's coming out of the chrysalis and emerging into there's the... There's movement, folks. There's, there's movement. movement. The wings are fluttering. Uh, if you get 6.1, uh, 6, oh, now you get 6.1 automatically free. Uh, well, not completely automatically. You'll have to download it. Uh, but it's worth uh, getting 6.0 now so you can have it. And uh, 6.1, the minute it's available. Uh, you can also get the beta version now if you are a owner. You can also get this show at the website grc.com and that's free. He has two unique versions, a 16 kilobit version for the bandwidth the paired and uh, the very well done transcripts uh, by Elaine Ferris uh, so you can read along as you listen or search or that kind of thing. All that's at grc.com along with Spinrite and uh, Shields Up, and uh, Valid Drive, and all the great stuff Steve does in assembly language in the middle of the night. We are... <laughs> when do you? What are your coding hours? You're not a late night coder, I don't think. No, I'm... I'm 68. I'm not a late night coder. <laughs> uh, when, I, when I remodeled my home, uh, and I was 38, I had blackout drapes installed yeah. in the master bedroom. So you you know, I, I have normal cloth drapes, and then behind it is opaque, like thick, I don't know, vinyl. Uh, so that because I, I would be coding and I would be looking out the window and noticing the sky was getting lighter. Yeah. It's like, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, that feeling. You know, and I always afterwards, I chastised myself. I, I never wanted to stop, but I but I was useless the next day. Right. I mean, it just screwed everything up. So day, yeah. uh, what you need to have is the self-control back then to make yourself go to sleep. Now I don't need self-control because I'm tired. And so, uh, so I. I'm like looking forward to hitting the sack and being fresh in the morning. Well, it is fresh, almost 6.1, almost fully cooked. Uh, we have the show at our website. What? What? L L Lori does comment when I mentioned that. She says, well, yes, you're tired. You just coded for 18 hours yeah, straight. It's amazing. So there is that. 6 a.m. till 10 p.m. or something like that, yep. right? Yeah. Yep. Very nice. He's a hardworking guy. Uh, I love we, to code. Yeah. I mean, it's fun, isn't it? Yeah, I am completely stuck. It's better than anything I've ever found. Well, oh. except one thing, but you know you can't do second that all best the time. thing. Yeah, that's right. A lot of endorphins, though. Very good for the endorphins. Uh, we have copies of the show at our website, twit.tv slash sn. We have the same sixty-four kilobit audio that Steve has, but we also have video. That's our unique format. You can watch the video on YouTube as well. In fact, a great place to go to share clips. If you wanted to share that little clip we were talking about earlier with friends and family so they understand how important it is to secure their email, for instance, uh, you could do that right there on the YouTube channel. Uh, best thing to do probably is subscribe, though, in your favorite podcast player. You can get audio or video automatically as soon as we're done. With the ads, if you're not a club member, without the ads, if you are, uh, just find your favorite podcast client and uh, subscribe. We will be back here doing the show as we do every Tuesday, right after Mac Break Weekly, 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern, 21.30 UTC. I will see you back here right then. Thank you, Steve. 
I will be back in a week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, editor in chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space books and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time. Secure